busqué y no pudo llenarme ningún tesoro que pueda ganar me saciará mas llegaste tú y me diste vida nueva y cada deseo se cumplirá aquí en tu amor no hay no hay nada nada mejor no hay nada nada mejor no hay nada nada mejor que mi Dios oh. Soy porque el Dios de los montes es el Dios de los valles. No hay lugar que me pueda alejar de tu gracia y amor.
Hola, bienvenidos a Iglesia en Casa. Bienvenidos a Saddleback Church. Soy el Pastor Will y quiero ser el primero en darte la bienvenida este fin de semana. Donde sea que estés ahorita en tu casa, en tu trabajo, donde sea que estés, gracias por conectarte el día de hoy. Hoy vamos a tener un tiempo de adoración y juntos vamos a aprender de la Palabra de Dios. Y no sé si sabías, pero aparte de este servicio en línea, tenemos servicios para niños y para jóvenes. Si tú deseas que tus niños o tus jóvenes se conecten cada fin de semana a su reunión virtual, déjanos saber. Ahorita en este video, en el chat, vas a ver los enlaces para que puedas registrar a tus hijos. Ahora, antes de continuar, te invito, relájate. Este fin de semana es para estar juntos aquí en familia. Esta es tu iglesia. Y una manera que te puedes conectar es a través de nuestro chat. Tal vez ahorita en el chat quieres poner un thumbs up o un high five, o tal vez quieres poner tu petición de oración. Sea como te quieras conectar, te animo a que lo hagas este fin de semana. Nuestro deseo es que juntos adoremos a Dios aquí en iglesia, aquí con tu familia. Antes de continuar, miremos esto. When the pandemic hit, our life changed quite a bit. Saddleback had uh, sent out an email saying, hey, we need some volunteers. We've got an opportunity for um, a food pantry where we're going to be serving some food to some families that are in need. And if you are interested, just respond to the email. And I literally kind of felt like when I got the email back that I'd won the lottery. Like, yes, they, I get to do it. I get to do it. I have something to do. Right now, I volunteer anywhere between three to four hop-ups on an average per week. As my kids tell me, they're like, Mom, you got a full-time job. I'm like, yes, and I got a great boss. And he's provided. There's days we don't know. We don't know if we have enough to serve. And before you know it, we've got enough to serve that last car. We're exhausted by the end of the day, but our hearts are full. I get home, and the joy inside me is just endless. So I, I just feel grateful. Sometime in December, I received a phone call from the Orange County Register. This person continued to talk to me and say, hey, we're interested in interviewing you for the 100 most influential people in Orange County. And I immediately said, no, thank you. And I'm like, um, that is not me. I'm not interested. Um, I'm just kind of doing my thing. And she was like, well, can I ask you why? And I said, you know, my goal is just to serve. I didn't even know, because I'd cut her off, that the story was about volunteering. So she said, but that's what I want to talk to you about. It's about all the volunteering you've done with Saddleback. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. I definitely feel honored that I was chosen to represent all the volunteers, all the leads that I work with, the truck drivers. I mean, you guys, it's just, it really takes the village to, to make this work. And it's the most amazing village and family that you could ever work with. And how he's using me right now, it is very overwhelming for me because I don't see me as worthy of like him using me like this. But I just keep trusting him and, and I, I'm like, okay, God, then just keep using me. What I know is I'll forever serve. I will forever be that volunteer that's going to be doing this um, full time. And the joy that he has provided for me in the last nine months, or really even in this last nine years of my journey of faith, has just been incredible. Así como Alana, hay muchas personas aquí en Saddleback Church y en Saddleback en español que han ayudado a todo lo que estamos haciendo con los bancos de comida en nuestra comunidad. Sí, gracias a ti y gracias a todos los voluntarios que han marcado una gran diferencia en la iglesia, en mi vida y en toda nuestra comunidad. Ayudando y participando de estos bancos de comida es una de las maneras que te puedes conectar. Pero hay diferentes maneras aquí en nuestra iglesia que tú te puedes conectar. Tenemos grupos pequeños, grupos para hombres, para mujeres. Tenemos diferentes recursos para que tú puedas crecer en tu fe. Y estoy muy emocionado porque este sábado, febrero 6, tenemos Saddleback en vivo. Es una reunión presencial aquí en Lake Forest. Así que si vives en el condado de Orange 
o está, vives cerca de Lake Forest, te animo a que vengas y participes con nosotros este sábado, febrero 6 a las 11 am. Trae tu mascarita y juntos vamos a adorar juntos y también vamos a orar como familia. Saddleback en vivo este sábado. Ahora vamos a tomar un tiempo de adoración. Y yo lo sé, la adoración se mira diferente ahora que lo hacemos en casa. Pero eso no cambia lo que Dios hace a través de la adoración. Y te animo que ahí en tu casa, en tu hogar, con tus hijos, con tu esposo, con tu esposo, tal vez estás tú solo en tu, en tu hogar, te animo que cantes al Señor, adórale, levanta tus manos, levántate, aplaude, o solo siéntate ahí y piensa en la presencia de Dios. Él está ahí presente contigo. Él habita en nuestra adoración. Así que prepárate y adoremos juntos. No puedo volver al pasado Controlar lo que pueda venir Pero aquí en el presente Es donde tú me prometes estar No puedo más No puedo más Si tú no estás todo en mí, pues todo en mí, también a ti, ven y encuéntrame otra vez. Camine por el valle Tu amor para todo temor Y como el sol la forma la sombra Tu gloria brilla en mi debilidad
La Biblia dice en Deuteronomio capítulo 31, versículo 6. Dice, no temas ni tengas miedo, porque Jehová tu Dios es el que va contigo. No te dejará y no te desampará. La Biblia nos enseña historias de personas que fueron rescatadas por Dios. Que en su momento más difícil, más doloroso, Dios estuvo presente y los rescató. Historias como Jonás que por su desobediencia, la Biblia dice que fue tirado al mar y un gran pez se lo tragó, pero tres días después, Dios lo rescató. Historias como la de Raab, que vivía una vida muy desordenada, una vida que no agradaba a Dios, pero decidió entregar su vida a Dios y Dios transformó su legado. Personas como Daniel, que por su obediencia a Dios, fue tirado al pozo de los leones. Pero la Biblia dice que Dios estuvo presente y lo rescató. Y es por eso que Daniel dice en el capítulo 6, versículo 27, dice, hablando de Dios, Él salva y libra y hace señales y maravillas en el cielo y en la tierra. Dios rescata y rescató a Jonás, a Raab y Daniel. Y la promesa es esto, que también te puede rescatar a ti y me puede rescatar a mí. No sé lo que tú estás pasando en este momento, cómo estás enfrentando esta pandemia o cómo estás empezando esta semana. Pero lo que sí sé es la promesa de que Dios siempre está con nosotros. ¿Por qué no cierras tus ojos ahí donde tú estás y por qué no oramos? Padre, te damos gracias por la promesa de tu presencia, en todo momento, en los días difíciles, en medio de un pozo de leones, en medio de una vida desordenada, en medio de, de nuestra desobediencia, Señor, tú estás con nosotros, listo para rescatarnos. Hoy, después de adorar, de nuevo te entregamos nuestra vida a ti, Señor. Haz lo que tengas que hacer con nosotros. Ayúdanos durante este tiempo. Te necesitamos Señor y oramos todo esto en el nombre de Jesús Amén ahora te animo que prepares tu corazón hoy tenemos un mensaje que estoy seguro que te va a ayudar a crecer en tu fe y si quieres las notas de este mensaje mira la descripción de este video y así puedes seguir al pastor punto por punto ahora miremos el mensaje de este fin de semana Hello everybody Have I told you lately that I love you? I, I really, really do. And I miss seeing you uh, in person. You know, this past week, we had uh, some good news and we had some bad news. Uh, the bad news is that this past week, we had more members of our church family sick with COVID-19 virus than we've had during any other week uh, in the past year. And we also lost three more members of Saddleback Church who died from COVID-19 this week. So our hearts and our prayers go out to all of you families and who are Saddleback members grieving the loss of a family member due to COVID-19. Uh, we love you and, and we grieve with you uh, and, and our hearts are with you. And for the rest of you, please, this is serious. Don't pretend this, this COVID-19 is, is not deadly. COVID-19 is now the number one killer in America. More than cancer, heart attack, heart disease, anything else. It's the number one killer in America. And as I mentioned last week, more Americans have died now from COVID than died in World War II. And if not enough people don't get vaccinated, we, we could lose 650,000 uh, people by, uh, by springtime. So please, please keep yourself safe. We need you to make it through this difficult season. Now, the good news of this past week is that on Monday, January 25th, our church celebrated its 41st birthday. In fact, I'm going to be sending you a birthday email that I know is going to encourage you. I want you to read it all when you get it from me. It's a birthday email on our 41st birthday. You know, one of the many big projects that we've been working on while we've been unable to uh, meet in person due to COVID pandemic 
is a plan to totally renovate and refresh and upgrade our worship center at the Lake Forest campus. It's, it's going to be really cool. Uh, we're giving it a major facelift. We're preparing it for reopening in the days ahead. I'll be eager to share with you some of the really exciting drawings of the big upgrades that we're making in the worship center, including new seating. I've sat in them, woo comfortable. And some surprises too that are gonna be really excited. Uh, now, we're in a short series that I'm calling The Awesome Power Vision. And in the last message, we looked at Christ's vision for his family, which is the church. And I, if you remember, I only shared the first half of it, and so today I wanna to share the second half of Christ's vision for his family. Unity is the soul of fellowship. If you destroy a church's unity, you rip the heart out of the body of Christ. Unity is the essence, unity is the core of how God wants us to experience life together in his church. Unity in the church is so important. I think I mentioned this last week. The Bible has far more to say about Christians living in harmony and unity than it says about heaven or it says about hell. Did you know that? God wants you to experience true unity, true community, true oneness, true harmony with other believers. Now, of course, in heaven, we're going to experience this real community perfectly. But you know what? God wants us to practice it here on earth. Now, nothing is more valuable to God than his church. It is his bride. It is his body. It is his flock. The Bible tells us that Christ died for the church. It says that in Ephesians. That's why the unity of God's family was the number one topic on Jesus' mind as he approached the cross. Why? He was going to die for the church. If there had been something more important to Jesus, you can be sure he would have prayed about it right before the cross. But in John 17, which is Jesus' prayer before his crucifixion, Jesus mentions his vision for our unity multiple times in John 17. Remember, I asked you this last week to read John 13 to 17 several times during the week. Because in John 17, 20 to 21, Jesus prayed this for you. He said, I'm praying for all who will believe in me because of my disciples' testimony. And my prayer for them is that they'll be unified as one. Father, just as you and I are one, may they be unified united as one. Now, like every human parent, our Heavenly Father wants to see his children get along with each other. You want your kids to get along. You want your grandkids to get along. And so today, we're going to look at how we can do that, how we can get along better as brothers and sisters in the family of God. But first, let me summarize uh, last week's message for those of you who missed it. Uh, on the outline, there are 12 statements that summarize why unity is so important to the church. And I'm not going to try to share all the scripture verses that we looked at last week. In fact, I'm just going to give you these 12 statements. But why is unity in the church so important? Well, here's what God's word says. Number one, the Bible teaches us that my unity with other believers is the proof that I'm saved. All right. Number two, the Trinity is our model for unity. Number three, Jesus' last prayer request was that the members of his church would live in unity. Number four, God gives us his glory so that we'll be unified. And number five, our unity is our greatest witness to unbelievers. Number six, Unity removes fear and creates boldness. If you want to be less fearful and more bold, this is the key to it. We talked about that last week. Number seven, when a church is truly unified, everybody's needs are met. Number eight, baptism and communion are visible signs of unity. And nine, focusing on our common purpose is what creates unity. Number 10, Unity begins when we realize that we are incomplete without each other. I need you, you need me. Nobody's got all the gifts, we need each other. Number 11, Jesus died to unite us, not to divide us. 
And number 12, Jesus expects me to work hard at unifying Christians, and he expects you and me together to work on it together. Now, with these statements as our foundation, and that's what we talked about all last week, the natural question is, what's my part? What's my role? How am I supposed to do my part in fulfilling Christ's vision? Because one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, did you do what I asked you to do? So let's talk about it. How can I be an agent of unity in my church, in my church? Well, since God paid the highest price for the church, he wants it protected, especially from the damage that's caused by division and conflict and disharmony. And God says that if you're a part of God's family, then he expects you, you to be an agent of unity. You are commissioned by Jesus, whether you know it or not, you know it now, you're commissioned by Jesus to do everything possible to preserve the unity, protect the fellowship, and promote the harmony in your church family. And by the way, to all believers, among all believers. Now let's look at uh, four simple steps. I could have given you a dozen this week, but I thought, you know, I gave you 12 points last week. Let's cut it down to just four. <laughs> Number one, here's a first step on how you can be an agent of harmony and unity in your church. Number one, focus on what we share, not our differences. When you get together with other Christians, focus on the things we have in common, what we share in common, not our differences. Romans 14, verse 19, I love this, in the Phillips translation, it says this, let us concentrate on the things which create harmony. All right, let us concentrate on the things that create harmony and on the growth of our fellowship together. Now, let's think about this for a minute. What does it mean to concentrate? What do you do when you concentrate? Do you, you let your mind just go anywhere? No, no, it means you focus. You focus. It means you give it your full attention. You don't casually concentrate. It's intentional. When you concentrate, you have chosen to concentrate. You choose to focus. You choose to decide to figure out what you're gonna focus on. And when he says, let's focus on the things that create harmony and unity, he's saying you're gonna decide to figure out what are the common things that we share as brothers and sisters in God's family? So what are they? What are the things that we share in common as brothers and sisters in the family of God? Because we're all different, we look different, we act different, we're from different backgrounds, we different sizes and shapes, we're different genders, different races. Well, what are the things that we share in common that God wants us to concentrate on? Well, God tells us in Ephesians 4, that we share seven big things in common. This is not all, but in Ephesians 4, it says there are seven big things we share in common. He says, I want you to focus on that. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. Notice how many times he used the word one in this, in this paragraph. He says, there's only one body, and there's one spirit, and we've been called to one hope. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and only one God, who is the Father of us all, who is over all, and is through all, and is in all. Now, let's look at these phrases. He said, focus on the things that you have in common. We're one body. Jesus doesn't have multiple bodies. He just has the church. We have one spirit. We've all been given the same Holy Spirit at salvation. We all share one hope, what's that? It's the hope of the second coming of Jesus. He didn't stay dead, he resurrected, he went back to heaven and he promised to return. We have one Lord, Not we don't worship multiple gods, we have one faith and that faith is contained in this one book, not multiple books, it's in this one book, the one faith that God has given to us. We have one baptism, which means you don't have to be rebaptized every time you sin. And of course there's only one God. So what he's saying, we share the same salvation, we share the same forgiveness, we share the same grace, we share the same mercy, we share the same life, we share the same future. These factors are far more important 
than your gender or your race or your age or your economic status or your background or your sins or anything else, your size. These are the things that God wants us to focus on, not our personal differences. Now, it's important to remember that in all of the differences that we have too, not just things we have in common, but in all of the differences we have, guess what? Those all came from God too. So it was God who chose to give us different personalities. It was God who chose to give us different backgrounds, different races. It was God who chose to give us, you know, different amounts of hair, different preferences, personalities, all kinds. So that means that we should value and enjoy and learn from those differences in our church family too. Not just what we have in common, but even celebrate our differences, which are God-given. Now, God doesn't want you to merely tolerate other Christians. He wants you to be united with them. But unity is not uniformity. Did you hear that? You might write that down. Unity is not uniformity. God doesn't, when he says, I want you to be united, he doesn't want us all to be alike. If, he, if he'd done that, he would have made us all alike. Uh, and, and if you'd wanted that, uh, sorry, that's not going to happen because God made us all different. When, when you say, uh, I don't like the way that person acts or lives, or I don't like their race or whatever, you're, you're basically saying, God, you made a mistake. You should have made everybody like me. God wants unity, but he doesn't want uniformity. For unity's sake, we must never let differences divide us. We should celebrate them, but we shouldn't let our differences divide us. We have to stay focused on what matters most. What is that? Learning to love each other as Christ has loved us and fulfilling God's five purposes for each of us in his church. Now, I, I, I know what you may be thinking right now uh, because you're saying, Rick, okay, yeah, I get it. But what about all those differences in members in our church that irritate me. <laughs> How am I supposed to deal with them? How do I be unified with somebody who just irritates me to no end? Well, let me show you a couple of verses. First, con let me just say this. Conflict is usually a sign that the focus has shifted to less important issues, something that the Bible calls in Romans 14, disputable matters. There, there's some things we have to agree on, like Jesus is the Son of God. He died and rose again. He's coming back one day. The Bible is God's word. These are not disputable matters. But disputable matters are things where well-meaning Christians can have difference of opinions. And, and in Romans 14, that whole chapter is about that. You might read that this week. But it says this in Romans 14, 1. You must accept all fellow believers even weak ones, without arguing or judging them for different opinions. That's not an easy verse to understand. Oh, yes, it is. It's just an easy verse, to, harder verse to do. It's easy to understand. The message translation of this verse amplifies it. Here's Romans 14, 1 in the message. Welcome with open arms, fellow believers, who don't see things the way you do. Did you hear that? Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something that you don't agree with. This is scripture, Romans 14, 1. They have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. Now, did you notice that little phrase at the end there? They have their own history to deal with. You know, what, what is he talking about? Well, we, all, we always tend to look at how far a person has to go. We don't know how far they've already come. And if you knew how far they'd already come, you'd probably be rejoicing with them and go, man, they've come a long way. But we're always judging them from where they are now to where they need to be. And people are doing that with you too. But they have their own history to deal with. Well, it means that when you don't know the background of a fellow Christian and your church family, when you don't know the background, when you don't understand their background of a brother or sister, maybe they came out of an urban area, or maybe they came out of a rural area, or maybe they came out of a suburban area, or maybe they came out in poverty, or maybe they were an orphan. When you don't know the background and understand it of a brother and sister in Christ, you know what you tend to do? Either dismiss them or judge them for behavior that you don't understand. Let me give you a question, okay, that will change your perspective on how you deal with people that you don't like 
or that you don't understand. Okay, here's the question. Stop asking. When you see somebody that does things and you go, that just irritates me no end. Stop asking in your mind, what's wrong with you? And start asking this, what happened to you? What happened to you? Because there's always a trauma. There's always a reason, a crisis behind behavior. Hurt people hurt people. And if you find somebody who's hurting other people, if you dig deep enough, you'll find that they have been hurt. And they and the people who deserve it the least are those who need the most massive doses of love. Stop asking when you see people that irritate you, what's wrong with them? And start asking a much more sympathetic, empathetic question. What happened to them? I wonder what warped them, what caused them to be so whatever it is. Now, Paul understood the great importance of unity in the family of God. So he's passionate when he talks about unity. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, in the New Living, it says this, let there be real harmony, real harmony, so there are no divisions in the church. This is what Jesus wants. This is his vision for the church. I want no divisions in the church. I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought, and purpose. If you're taking notes, circle the word plead and circle the word purpose. Those two words, plead and purpose, for real unity to take place, uh, for it to happen in your church, it takes both passion. Paul's pleading. I plead you. I'm begging you to get along with each other. For unity, there has to be passion and there has to be a common purpose. That's why we've never, in 41 years, never had a split in in Saddleback Church. Not once. Why? Because we've had the same common purposes for 41 years. So that's the starting point, all right? Now let me give you a second step to being an agent of unity. Number two, realize that I must continually work at unity. I, I have to realize this is not something just happens. It's not accidental. If I'm going to be close to other people, if I'm going to be in harmony with other people, if I'm going to be unified in a small group or unified in our church, I've got to work at it. Now, the Bible says that. Ephesians 4, 3 says this. Make every effort. You're taking notes? Underline that. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Bind yourselves together, living in peace with each other. Now, that phrase, make every effort, means it's going to take some work. Unity just doesn't happen in your family, in your marriage, in a relationship, in our church. Unity happens only when you are intentional about it. And you say, I'm going to make it happen. We're going to make every effort to build unity. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, I'm giving you some tips. I could give you a bunch more, but these are ones we can work on right now. Let me give you a couple things to not do because these destroy unity. These create division instead of vision. Division always destroys vision. Number one, here's something not to do. Don't bring worldly values into the church. Yeah, why? Because every time you bring worldly values into the church, it causes division. It causes division. Now, one of the world's values, and we see it everywhere today, is the idolizing of celebrities. You know we now live in a celebrity culture. There's a celebrity on the cover of every magazine practically every week. And with the advent of social media, everybody now wants to be their own little celebrity. And they're turning their lives into reality shows. And and everybody, I mean, junior high girls and And sixth grade boys are doing everything for an audience today. And and people are being marketed as if they're a product. And many people are actually doing it to themselves. They're, They're marketing themselves as a product. And so actors and musicians and politicians and practically everybody else are being packaged and produced. They're long on reputation, but they're short on character. It can't be that way in the church. Because in the church, character matters, not reputation, not fame. There's a difference between fame and character. A lot of people are famous just for being famous. They've never really even done anything. 
But God says what matters is not your reputation, but your character. Why does it matter? Because God says it matters. Now, whenever we focus on personalities or preferences or power or pleasure or prestige or popularity, guess what? Division is always going to happen. You're not going to have unity when you focus on those things. But if we concentrate on our relationships and loving each other, then harmony results. And Paul is pleading for this in his letter to the Corinthians. You know, let me give you a little background on this. In the church at Corinth, uh, they were having a lot of conflict. And they started having conflict and division uh, in their church family for many, many different reasons. But the biggest one of all was because they started placing their loyalty and giving their loyalty to leaders over their common loyalty to Christ and each other. And all of a sudden, they started dividing up over, well, I like this leader and I like that leader and I'm, I'm of that party and I'm of this party and that's my guy and that's your guy. And then they brought it all into the church. So Paul actually had to write a letter to them to rebuke them. And that book, that letter, is called 1 Corinthians. And it's filled with rebukes to Christians who had started acting like unbelievers. In fact, in every chapter in 1 Corinthians, Paul deals with a different cause of division in the church. Now, let me just show you one. In chapter 3, he's talking about when you're showing favoritism of different leaders. He says this, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 2 to 5. He says, you're acting, talking about in the church, you're acting in the same way unbelievers act in the world. He says, the proof of your immaturity is your arguing and quarreling. The proof of immaturity is your arguing and quarreling and the divisions you've created. He says, whatever you find create a division, quarreling, arguing, he says the people that are immature. He said, it still proves, proves that you still belong to the world and that you're living by worldly values. And then he gives an example. He says, you know, when one of you says, you know, I support Paul. I'm from the party of Paul. And another says, I support Apollos. I'm from the party of Apollos. He said, you're acting like unbelievers, not like Christ. He says, is Apollos important? No. He says, is Paul, is Paul important? No. So he says here, when you start, when, when you're, when you start having personality issues and people are choosing up, well, I like this leader, but I don't like that leader. He said, you know what? Then you're going to have division. If you let me, listen, if you ever let me or a TV preacher or a radio preacher or a politician or even yourself cause a division in a church, you're going to know that worldly values have seeped into the church. Okay, so uh, uh, avoid bringing what the world thinks is important into the church. Second thing to avoid uh, uh, to work at unity is this. Don't be sucked into the world's fights. Don't be sucked into the world's fights. Now, I don't have to tell you that there's a lot of conflict out there in society, in our culture, in the world. People are arguing about everything. And today it's gotten worse because we have the communication tools through the Internet where anybody can argue about anything, and they do, and they do. You know, I, I was interviewed the other day, and one of the first questions, uh, they always want to ask me about politics, and I couldn't care less about that, but they, they, the first question they asked was, what did Jesus think and say about politics? And my answer was, not much, not much. In fact, in all my studies of Jesus' ministry, and I've read through the Gospels hundreds of times, I've only found two statements that Jesus made that were political statements in three and a half years. Now, I distinguish between moral statements, which are about right or wrong, and political statements, which are often a matter of opinion. But moral statements you can back up with Scripture. But there's no verse in the Bible, for instance, there's no verse in the Bible that tells you that taxes should be higher or lower. There's just not a verse. But I do know that Jesus said this in John 18, 36, when he was asked a political question, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. This is not our fight. 
the fighting that's going on out there, that's not our fight. We got a battle, but it's not that one. Okay, and our weapons are different too. And now, as Christians, we are called to speak up for the truth. We are called to speak up for the vulnerable. We are called to speak up for the elderly, for the unborn, for the poor. We are called in scripture to speak up for those imprisoned, for immigrants, as the Bible calls them, foreigners or strangers or aliens. We are called to speak up for those denied justice. Now, those are moral issues that can be backed up with hundreds of verses in the Bible. In fact, did you know there are over 2,000 verses in the Bible about taking care of the poor? 2,000. And they're about that same number about making sure everybody is treated fairly and justly. Justice has a couple thousand verses too. So we got to wonder uh, 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 about what are we going to do with those? But there are a lot of issues out there that people are fighting over the Bible is silent about. It just says nothing. If it's not our fight, it's not our fight. Now, if you've ever been on social media, you know that there are a lot of Christians out there who are ready to pick a fight with you because they're addicted to anger as much as some people are addicted to drugs. What do you do with those people? Now, this is I'm trying to be practical in this message. What do I do with internet trolls? Who, who they just want to pick a fight, and many of them are Christians. Well, here's what the Bible says. We always go back to the word. It's not, my opinion is worthless. What, what matters is what does God say about these questions? And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, it says this about dealing with people who are just like to fight, like to get in arguments. 2 Timothy 2, 23 and 24 says this don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. <laughs> That's pretty clear. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And then it says this, listen, the Lord's servant must never quarrel. Are you a servant of God? Well, that's scripture. And the Bible says the Lord's servant must never quarrel. As a servant of God, I am not allowed to quarrel. The Lord's servant must never quarrel. Instead, it says, you must be kind to everybody. If you're going to be a servant of God, if you're going to be a woman of God, you're going to be a man of God, the Lord's servant must never quarrel. Instead, you must be kind to everybody, able to teach, and patient with everyone. You must be humble, gently teaching those who oppose the truth. So what does that mean? It means in a world, world where everybody likes to argue today, don't start arguments, don't get into arguments, don't get hooked into an argument, don't participate in an argument. In many, many places in Scripture, particularly Psalms and Proverbs, particularly Proverbs, we are told to stay clear of argumentative people. Did you know that? Just go read Proverbs. We are told to stay clear of people who like to quarrel, like to argue. And yet, you know, I've heard, actually heard of small groups and churches that split up because they argued over secondary issues and they allowed non-essentials to take precedent over our commitment to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. That makes our Heavenly Father sad. But it's not new. No, it's not new. It's been going on for 2,000 years. In fact, in the church meeting in Rome, the church that met in Rome, and Paul had to write to them, they got into a big conflict. And you know what the conflict over was there in the church in Rome? Food. <laughs> the church in Rome started having a split because they were, had a conflict over rules about what you could and couldn't eat. <clears throat> and Paul had to write them this word, Romans 12, 20. It's a word we need in 2021. Romans 12, 20 says this. Don't tear apart the work of God. Don't tear apart the work of God over a rule about food. Now, it may not be a rule about food. It may be who you voted for. It may be some other issue. Don't tear apart the work of God over a secondary issue. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the church in Corinth was a very divided church and they fought over everything. 
But their favorite conflict was over leadership. And so in chapter three, Paul had to remind them that if we allow our support of any leader of any kind to create division or tension in the church between us and our brothers and our sisters, God says our priorities are out of whack. It's not a God, it's not Christ-like, and it's a sin that God will judge. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter three, verse two to five. Paul says, you know what? I wanted to teach you some deeper truths from the word of God, but I couldn't because you were arguing all the time. And, and he said, it just showed your level of maturity. In fact, here's what scripture says. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 to 5. Paul says, I had to feed you with milk, not solid food, for you still aren't mature. You're not mature enough to digest it. You're acting in church the same way unbelievers act in the world. And this proof of your immaturity is you're arguing and quarreling and the divisions you created and it proves you still belong to the world and you're living by worldly values. So he was talking about the, this thing about a, who says, well, I'm of this club and I'm of that club and I'm supporting this guy and I'm supporting that guy. It doesn't really matter. Now, the third step, the third step in creating uh, unity in your small group, unity in your church, unity in your family, unity in your marriage, Here's a big one. Be realistic in my expectations. Be realistic in my expectations. All of us had unrealistic expectations when we got married. All of us bring unrealistic expectations to church. And to expect any church to always do everything right and to minister perfectly to everyone all the time, that's fantasy. In the first place, the church is filled with imperfect people Sinners like me, you're looking at number one. I'm the chief of sinners. The church is filled with imperfect people, so a group of imperfect people will never be able to create a perfect community. It's like in a marriage. I'm a sinner, my wife's a sinner, she married a bigger sinner, me, and uh, two sinners can't create a perfect relationship. We need to remember Psalm 119.96, it says this, Nothing is perfect except your word. Psalm 119, 96. Nothing is perfect except your words. Everything is broken on this planet. The weather, the economy, our bodies, marriages, our relationships, our minds. Nothing on this planet works perfectly except God's word. It's perfect. So to expect perfection in your church is to set yourself up for a massive disappointment. Now, a church can be healthy without being perfect, okay? Just like your kids or grandkids, okay? My kids are, are, are not perfect, but they're healthy. They're healthy. My grandkids have never been perfect, but they're healthy. And a church can be healthy without being perfect. You know, one of the things I've noticed is that when people read a lot of books about the ideal church, and the way it ought to be, it just makes them cynical. Why? Because they're hoping for something that doesn't exist. And when you discover that what God intends in real fellowship to be, it's easy to get discouraged by the gap between the ideal and the real, all right? Well, you know, you read all these books about the ideal church and then you go live in the real church, you just get cynical. But let me say this, and I want you to listen closely. Even with all its faults and all its favors, failures and all its mistakes and all its sin, Jesus passionately loves his church. And he wants us to do the same. If we're gonna be Christ-like, a lot of people use the church but don't love it. We must passionately love the church in spite of its perfections longing for the ideal while criticizing the real is evidence of spiritual immaturity. On the other hand, setting, settling for the real without striving for the ideal is complacency. You know what maturity is? Maturity is living with the tension. For 41 years, I have lived with the tension of Saddleback Church between the ideal, what I knew it could be, and the real, what it was. I have loved our church deeply 
at every stage of its growth. When we had five people, I loved it. When we had 15 people, I loved it. When we had 30 people, I loved it. When we had 30,000, I loved it. But I, of all people, uh, uh, can see the glaring weaknesses in our church because I'm intimate. I've seen it from day one. And I have lived for 41 years with the tension between, yeah, it's really good, this is good, but it could be here. See, it's like parenting. In parenting, you don't wait for your kids to grow up before you start loving them. You don't wait for your kids to be mature before you start loving them. You love them at every stage of maturity. When, when my kids would bring me a picture at two years old and, and, and it would be just scribbling, and I'd say, that's perfect, honey. That's just perfect. What do I mean by that? It's perfect for that stage of maturity. Now, if Amy brought that to me, you know, in her 30s, I, I'd go, there's a problem here. But it's perfect at each stage. You need to learn to love people at every stage of their growth, and you need to learn to love our church as a whole in every stage of growth. Let me be honest with you. As somebody who has walked with Jesus now for over 60 years, and I'll just tell you this from experience, other believers will disappoint you. Other believers are gonna let you down in life but that's no excuse to stop fellowshipping with them. It's no excuse to stop loving them. God wants you to love the real church, not the ideal church. These people, the people you, you have a hard time with, they're your family. You're gonna live with them for eternity. And when they don't act like it, you can't just walk out on them. Instead, God tells us this, Ephesians 4, 2. New Living Translation, be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Believe me, in all of the counseling that I've done with people in our church, people can become disillusioned with the church for many understandable reasons. And the list could be what quite long. I could give you a long list of legitimate reasons for becoming disillusioned with the church. Conflict, hurt, hypocrisy, neglect, uh, pettiness, legalism, other sins. Uh, but rather than being shocked and surprised, we just gotta remember the church is made up of real people, sinners, including ourselves. And because of that, we hurt each other, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. But if you walk out of every situation in a church that you have difficulty with, where are you gonna build Christ-like character? Huh, where? Where are you gonna build it? If you run from a problem every time you have a problem, where are you gonna build character? You see, becoming like Christ requires problems and pressure and pain and persecution and a lot of other things we don't like. But as I told you many times, God's not interested in your comfort as much as he's interested in your character because you're not taking your comfort to heaven, you're taking your character to heaven. And the comfort is gonna be in heaven. This is the get ready stage. So let me just give you a practical assignment. If you know somebody who's thinking about leaving their small group or leaving their church family, you might encourage them to stay and work out their problem for their own character development. Reconciliation, not running away, is always the road to stronger character and deeper fellowship. It's always better to resolve a relationship than to replace it, always. On the other hand, Divorcing your church at the first sign of disappointment or disillusionment, that's just a mark of immaturity. It represents the same values of the world, which has no commitment to anything. I don't like it, I'm leading, I'm out of here. And, and they're serial divorces. Listen, God has things he wants to teach you in your church, in, if you're a member of Saddleback, in Saddleback Church, with people who think differently than you, have different background than you, look differently from you, and you're never gonna learn those lessons unless you become friends with them. As I already said, there's no perfect church to escape to because every church has its own set of weaknesses and problems and you go join another church, you just soon be disappointed again. Why? There's no perfect church. By the way, if you could find one, um, 
you shouldn't join it because once you join it, it's not going to be perfect anymore. Uh, you know, Groucho Marx was famous for saying he wouldn't want to belong to any club that would let him in. <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty, pretty smart. Because if a church has to be perfect to satisfy you, that same perfection is going to exclude you from membership because you're not perfect. I'm making light of this, but it's a serious issue. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor who was martyred for resisting the Nazis and Hitler, wrote a classic book on genuine community and fellowship. It's called Life Together. It was one of the greatest books on church membership ever written. And in Life Together, he suggests that disillusionment with our local churches is a good thing because it destroys our false expectation of perfection. He said, you know, the sooner you give up the illusion that a church has to be perfect in order to love it, the sooner you're going to quit pretending and start admitting that we're all imperfect. We all need grace. And that, that, that is the beginning of real community. You know, every church could put out a sign, no perfect people need apply. This is the only place for people to admit they're sinners, that we need grace, that we all need to grow. Bonhoeffer said, he who loves his dream of community more than Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter. So we don't give thanks for the Christian fellowship which we have been placed. He said, even when there's no great experience and no discoverable riches and a lot of weakness and small faith and difficulty, if on the contrary, we keep complaining that everything is paltry and petty, he said, we hinder God from letting our fellowship grow. That's strong words from a strong man. Colossians 3.14 says this, most of all, let love guide your life, for then the whole church will stay together in perfect harmony. What's the key? It's not rocket science. Let love light guide your life. 1 Peter 4.8 says this, powerful in the message, Love each other as if your life depended on it. Do you do that? You do that with other Christians? You love each other as if your life depended on it? Love makes up for practically anything. You know, I found that to be true, that Saddleback Church, when we had no buildings, we had no money, we had no, uh, uh, we had no big programs, we had no large staff, you know, we had a tent on a, moonscape, and that was about it. And yet thousands came. Why? Because people want to be where love is. If you have a church that genuinely loves people, genuinely loves each other, you'd have to lock the door to keep people out. People don't come because of a fancy program or a fancy preaching or fancy this or that. They come because their lives are changed by love. Now, finally, let me give you one other principle that I think we all need to work on uh, this year because we're in, a, in, a, in an age where there's more division going on in society. We just have to insulate ourselves from all of that uh, uh, conflict and love each other because if people like what they see in us, they'll listen to what we say. So let me give you one other principle from God's word that you can use to be an agent of unity, an agent of reconciliation. Number four, here it is. Offer encouragement instead of criticism. All right, just when you're talking to people, offer encouragement instead of criticism. That is so counterculture. Our culture doesn't offer encouragement. It offers criticism. That's all it offers. People make a living being critics. Nobody makes a living being an encourager. Romans 14, verses 19 and 20 says this in the message. Let's use all our energy. Okay, listen. Let's use all our energy in getting along with each other. You want to, you want to direct your energy in the right way? Use all our energy in getting along with each other. Help each other by using encouraging words. Help each other by using encouraging words. Don't drag others down by finding fault, okay? More encouragement, 
less criticism. Don't drag each other down by, by just finding fault. Now, I know what you're thinking. You say, Rick, I am all for encouragement, uh, but what do you do when something is wrong and everybody knows it and it's just wrong? Do, do you ignore it? You don't criticize it, you ignore it? The answer is, of course not. But listen, and this is a mark of leadership. You can learn the skill of sharing a rebuke or pointing out a problem in a positive way. That's a skill, okay? You can always learn how to share a rebuke or point out a negative, make a critique, but you say it in such a positive way that they're able to receive it. See, there's always two ways to say something. You can say it the nice way, and you can say it the not nice way. You've always got a choice. It is possible to speak a difficult truth in a positive way. I do it every week. And I could teach you how to do that too. And over the past 30, 40 years, I've taught a lot of pastors, literally hundreds of thousands of them around the world, how to do it, how to talk about a negative concept in a positive way. One of my eight questions that I use in preparing a message, and I teach this in the preaching seminar, is what is the most positive way to say it? Why? Why would you be interested in saying it in a positive way? Well, if you're interested in being persuasive, then you're gonna to need to learn that skill. Why? Because the Bible says it. Proverbs 16, verse 21 says this, a wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. That's scripture, that's the Bible. The more pleasant your words, the more persuasive you'll be. You might write this down. I am never persuasive when I'm abrasive. All right? I'm never persuasive when I'm abrasive. If I say something offensively, it will be received defensively. If I wanted to, I could get up here every week and put you on the defense in about 30 seconds and just tell you all the things you're doing wrong. You go, yeah, you're right. No, no. That doesn't change anybody. Telling it like it is doesn't change anybody. Telling it like it could be does. Telling it like it could be is speaking, preaching, teaching for faith. Now, I'll be honest with you. It's not hard to be negative when so much of our culture is negative. I mean, really, you're bombarded with a continual diet of criticisms and attacks and slanders and malicious talk. On all the cable news channels, we don't have news anymore on cable. We have three hours of opinion every night on every channel, just different opinions. And there's stereotyping and ad hominem attacks on people every single night on TV and every day on talk radio. So we live like fish in a culture of seawater. We live in a culture of negativity. And it's always easier to stand on the sidelines and take shots than it is to get involved and make a contribution. But God warns us over and over and over not to criticize, not to compare, not to judge each other. He says that literally a hundred times in scripture. Now you may not realize this, but when you criticize another believer who is doing something in faith, and you criticize what another believer is doing in faith and from a sincere heart and conviction, you're actually interfering with God's business. Did you know that? When you criticize another fellow Christian, a brother or a sister in Christ, who to the best of their knowledge, they're doing what they're doing in faith, Maybe you don't like it. Maybe you think it's wrong, but they're doing it in faith with a clear conscience and you criticize them. You are interfering with God's business. That's Romans 14. Romans 14 verse four says this. What right do you have to criticize somebody else's servants? They're not your servant. They're God's servant. God says, what right do you have to criticize somebody else's servant? Only the Lord can decide if they are doing right. That's verse four of Romans 14. Down in verse 10, the same chapter, Paul adds, 
that we must not stand in judgment or look down on other believers whose convictions differ from ours. Did you know that? Romans 14, verse 10, here's what it says. Philip's translation. Why do you criticize your brother's actions? Why do you try to make him look small? We'll all be judged one day, not by each other's standards or even by our own, but by the judgment of God. Do you know that when I judge you, if you're a believer, or when I judge any other believer, four things instantly happen. The Bible says this. Number one, I lose fellowship with God. Number two, I expose my own pride and insecurity. Number three, I set myself up to be judged by God. And number four, I harm the fellowship of the church. All of those are in the book of Romans. A critical spirit is a costly advice. You, advice. you, can't, you can't afford it. You know, the Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of our brothers and sisters. Um, and that's, that's in Revelation 12, verse 10. But in, in, in that, it's the devil's job to blame, to complain. It's the devil's, devil's job to criticize members of God's own family, which means when I do that or when you do that, we're being duped into doing Satan's work for him because he's the accuser of Christians. And when I accuse other Christians, when I criticize and I judge other Christians, when you do that, you're basically, Satan takes a holiday. Well, I don't need to do that. They're doing it for me. You're being the accuser. Remember, other Christians, no matter how much you disagree with them, are not the real enemy. Anytime we spend comparing or criticizing our fellow believers is time that should have been spent building up the unity of our fellowship. Now, I've got a lot more I can say about this, but our time's up. There are at least a dozen more principles I could teach you about being an agent of unity, but time's up. So let me sum it up with just two more verses. And in many ways, these two verses uh, represent the two different choices that you have today and that you have every day. Every single day of your life, you, you choose which of these verses you're gonna do. Now, the first choice is to live a self-centered life, not worry about those who we hurt, and walk around being critical and judgmental of other people, even other Christians. The second uh, choice is to live a Christ-centered life instead of a self-centered life, that cares about what he cares about most, that we learn how to really love. Let me show you the two verses. First one is Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, verses 13 to 15 uh, says this. You have been called to live in freedom. You've been called to live in freedom. Not freedom to indulge your selfish nature, though, but freedom to serve, freedom to serve each other in love. God's entire law is summed up in this phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you keep biting, this is scripture I'm reading, if you keep biting and devouring each other and tearing each other apart, I call them cannibal Christians, you will be destroyed by each other. You know what's sad? Is that verse describes a lot of Christians in culture today. A lot of Christians are as mean and demeaning and vitriolic and what they put in the comment sections of social media, you'd expect it from non-believers. But what's happened is the gospel has not penetrated their character. But there is an alternative and it's this next verse, 1 Peter 3.8. 1 Peter 3.8, NIV says this, let me sum it up for all of you live in harmony with each other. And then he says how, how we live in harmony. Be sympathetic, love each other as family, have compassion, and be humble. Okay? He says you, the way you live in harmony with each other is these four things. You be sympathetic, you love each other as family, you have compassion, and you be humble. Peter gives us four essential qualities that we all need to work on this year in this culture. He says they're the keys to living in harmony with Christians that you disagree with. They're the keys to maintaining unity in the church that God expects us to protect. Peter tells us that we will get to enjoy, listen, 
we get to enjoy all the benefits of a united church, a unified church, if we do four things. And by the way, when the church is as unified as the book of Acts, then you have the power and the miracles of Acts. But he says it takes four things to enjoy the benefits that God wants to give us, give us and give our church. Number one, if we sympathize with each other, instead of criticize or antagonize or polarize over our differences. If we value the most, if our, the thing we value the most is our relationship to each other in God's eternal family, instead of any other identity, which isn't gonna last. All those others are temporary. You know, I said this to somebody the other day. I am a six foot two white male American, overweight. But I have more in common with a five foot Asian woman who's a Christian than I do with a six foot two and a half white guy who's an American. Why? Because he's not going to heaven. He's not my brother. She is my sister for eternity. She, I'm already a family member with her. So it has nothing to do with the externals. It has everything to do with the heart. And that's the next one. He says, if we show compassion, if we show compassion instead of derision, if we show compassion instead of condescension, if we show compassion instead of di division, then we'll have the benefits of unity. And then he says, if we act with humility, if we act with humility instead of with inflexibility, instead of with irritability, instead of with animosity. I ended the message last week, the first half of this message on unity, with a question and, I, I, and a point that you probably hadn't thought about, and I want to say it again. Jesus is still waiting for us to be the answer to his prayer. The last thing Jesus said before he went to the cross is, Father, may they be one. We're anything but that. The church is not one. It's divided. It's divided by politics. It's divided by COVID. It's divided by wearing a mask. It's divided by racism. It's divided by all kinds of different stuff. Jesus is still waiting for his prayer to be answered. Will we be that generation that answers the prayer? The prayer that they may be one as we are one, Father, Will we be that? I'm in. I'm in. I hope you are too. Let's bow our heads. Father, uh, we've looked at a lot of scriptures today. We want your church to not be a, a, a thermometer that just looks like the same thing in culture and just registers what everybody else is doing around us. We want to be a thermostat. We want to set the culture. We want to change the culture. Uh, we, we want to uh, be able to turn the temperature up or down. We don't want to be thermometers. We want to be thermostats. And the only way we're going to do that is if we do it together. So I pray that we would have a new commitment to love each other, regardless of our background, of our race, of our politics, of our economic status, uh, of our gender, uh, of all the different things that on the surface divide us, help us to realize that the only thing that's gonna last in the entire universe is your church. Your family is the reason you created the universe. And we're a part of that. Thank you for that privilege. Help us to love the real church, not the ideal church. Now you pray. In your heart, if there's something you say, Lord, I, I want to be more loving, say that to him. I want to be more loving. I want to be an agent of unity. I don't want to be a divider. I want to be a unifier. If you've never invited Christ into your life, he's the one who starts making peace with you, and then you can make peace with others. Just say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. I want to get to know you and learn to trust you. I want to follow you as best I know how. Forgive me for all the stuff I've done wrong. And I ask you to humbly accept me into your family. I pray this in your name. Amen. Well, I do love you, and I thank God for you. And uh, next week, we'll get back on to the 
The rest of the vision messages, we're going to look at the vision for your family, a vision for your personal life, things like that. But we started with this one on the church. God bless you, everybody. Gracias por estar con nosotros este fin de semana. Es siempre es un gozo y siempre es tan bonito poder conectarnos y hacer iglesia en casa. Somos familia y somos una iglesia. Gracias por conectarte el día de hoy. Si hoy tú le entregaste tu vida a Jesús por primera vez, déjanos saber, queremos celebrar contigo. Mándanos un texto ahorita, agarra tu teléfono y mándanos un texto con la palabra Nueva Vida al número 97000. Tenemos tantos recursos para ayudarte a crecer en tu fe. Y si tú te quieres conectar a un grupo pequeño, a todas las reuniones virtuales que tenemos durante esta semana, o te quieres registrar al evento de Saddleback en vivo este sábado, lo puedes hacer mandando un texto con la palabra Conéctame al mismo número. O puedes ir a nuestro website, saddleback.com slash español. Ahí vas a encontrar todos los recursos y hasta grupos pequeños donde tú te puedes conectar. Y también diferentes eventos que están pasando en nuestra iglesia durante la semana. Y para dar tus diezmos y ofrendas como lo hacemos cada fin de semana, simplemente ve a saddleback.com slash give. Gracias por estar con nosotros este fin de semana. Nos vemos la próxima semana.